Good morning. My name is Erica James, Dean of the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Welcome to another engaging conversation of Beyond Business. An expansion of the Tarnopol Lecture Series, Beyond Business is an ongoing conversation that explores the most complex and pressing issues impacting individuals and organizations across the world. This year's three-part series shines a light on how analytics, artificial intelligence, and machine learning are providing viable pathways for solutions in every domain. Last month, we talked about how analytics is influencing critical decision-making in the field of finance. Today, we'll discuss how data and analytics can offer surprising ways to increase accountability and drive social good. And in January, we'll talk about how data comes into play both on and off the field in professional sports. I'm honored to be joined today by three impressive Wharton faculty members. Hamsa Bastani is a professor of operations, information, and decisions at Wharton. Dean Knox is a professor of operations, information, and decisions at Wharton and co-founder of research on policing reform and accountability. And Duncan Watts is a professor of operations, information, and decisions at Wharton and a director of the computational social, social science lab at the University of Pennsylvania. Today's conversation will be followed by an audience Q&A, so please use the comment section to submit your questions at any point throughout this conversation. So thank you all for joining me today. You look at very different kinds of problems in your research. Please give us a quick overview of your research and interests, and Hamsa, I, I want to start with you. Thank you, Erica, for hosting this panel. I'm really honored to be here. Uh, I guess I believe analytics and machine learning, like all of us, has huge potential for improving our ability to tackle socially impactful problems. Uh, and my collaborators and I have been working on a variety of applications, uh, including global health, uh, counter human trafficking and sustainability. Uh, for example, in the summer of 2020, we worked with the Greek government to deploy a targeted COVID-19 platform for millions of incoming travelers using reinforcement learning. Uh, and we were able to double the number of infected travelers identified at the border to preserve public health. Uh, more recently, we've been working with the Telfinder Alliance to uncover sex trafficking supply chains from deep web data uh, using support from analytics at Wharton, using deep learning, specifically large language models. Uh, a major challenge is that these environments are often highly resource constrained, and so we don't have the ability to gather, clean, and label large quantities of data, which is typically necessary for modern machine learning algorithms. So as a consequence, a significant fraction of my research is dedicated to designing novel machine learning algorithms for these so-called small data settings. Uh, so one strategy is adaptive learning where you gradually gather data over time to improve your model. That's actually what we deployed for the COVID-19 project I mentioned earlier, because we were starting with effectively zero knowledge about COVID risk. Uh, another strategy is transfer learning, where you learn not just based on data specialized to your current task, but you learn across many different data sources. So for instance, in our counter-trafficking work, we're designing new multimodal learning algorithms to combine multiple biased data views on human trafficking from things like deep web ads, consumer reviews, tax records, victim hotline data to create a more holistic view of trafficking risk. So Hamza, I want to stick with you for just a moment because it's a very unusual topic and you sit within the context of a business school and people wouldn't necessarily associate the work on human trafficking with business. Can you tell us a little bit about your personal story, how this came to be, how you developed this interest? Um, I guess I'm generally pretty passionate about uh, using machine learning and AI techniques for social good. That's kind of how I got into my PhD, uh, being a starting more from a healthcare perspective. Uh, but actually, um, I went to a conference by Global Fishing Watch, which is a nonprofit organization that's using like remote sensing data to and satellite data to understand uh, labor trafficking and poor behavior on the high seas. And that sort of was our entry point. Um, and I think there's lots of interesting machine learning questions, but also like supply chain questions that come in from an operations research angle, how victims are recruited, how they're actually being transported and unfortunately, um, you know, exploited. Uh, and so we get information from all of these angles that gives us a network structure. And that's sort of um, something that's really interesting from uh, an operations perspective. Thank you. So Duncan, let's let's go to you. Tell us a little bit about your research background and interest. 
Oh, thanks, uh, Erica. Yeah, so as you mentioned, I, I run the Computational Social Science Lab uh, here at Penn, and you know, Computational Social Science is really about integrating uh, methods and thinking uh, from computer science and uh, and social science, uh, and you know, often uh, involving uh, you know large uh, data sets, often uh, digital data. Uh, and so, you know, that's basically what we do uh, in the lab, uh, and we, we're interested in a variety of problems that tend to have very sort of applied uh, um, motivations. So we're, we're, we're not just interested in advancing basic science and, and methods, uh, but also uh, uh, trying to apply it to, to problems of societal relevance. So one thing that we'll talk about more today uh, is a project called PenMap, the Pen Media Accountability Project. Uh, where we're uh, ingesting, you know, large data sets around media consumption and production. So, what are, you know, what are what are the media producing? What are they telling us on an everyday basis? And also, uh, you know, how are people encountering that information and, and consuming it? Uh, to try to understand things like uh, bias and, and and misinformation and, and its effects on democracy. Um, but in addition to that, we also have another large project uh, using uh, cell phone uh, GPS data. Uh, to uh, improve modeling of COVID uh, with an emphasis on uh, local uh, interventions, uh, working sometimes with the city of Philadelphia. And we have another project where we're uh, examining uh, various types of small group dynamics, uh, whether it's uh, you know, groups of people uh, solving problems together or uh, deliberating on controversial topics. Uh, and, uh, and and developing new uh, experimental methods to to better understand, you know, uh, how to do that in in, a, in an optimal way over over various different uh, uh, contexts. Excellent, thank you so much. And Dean, let's let's come to you. You're doing some fascinating research on policing. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell us about that, and also how you gained this interest. Yes, I uh, so I study the oversight of police organizations, which is, I think, one of the most challenging managerial contexts that, that we work with. Yeah, it's, it's a setting in which uh, the data that we have is extremely incomplete. If you think about what kind of events get discretionarily recorded by officers and, and what gets reported or, or misreported about those events, it's an extremely challenging data environment. So statistically, it, it's a fascinating problem where the strategy that we, have, that we have to take is to reason about the best and worst case scenarios for this extremely complex process, given only the tiny fragments that we're able to see. Uh, practically speaking, uh, it covers a pretty broad range of individual accountability. So making sure that officers who commit misconduct are investigated and disciplined for their actions, uh, all the way to, to police forces writ large, looking at how well they represent and reflect the communities that they serve and, and how those decisions to, to hire and deploy different kinds of officers lead to different kinds of enforcement behavior. Uh, we do a lot of collaborative work with uh, civil rights organizations. So I work with the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division, with the ACLU, with the NAACP uh, to provide technical support, data analytic support uh, to help them advance their goal of, of improving policing in, in the communities that, that, they, uh, that they serve. And so this again, is I'm... a... Uh, an issue. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 please, please continue. Uh, so it's a, it's a issue that has, has been sort of near and dear to me for, for quite some time. Uh, I came into it in earnest uh, a couple of years ago when policing really came into the public eye. A lot of academic research started being cited uh, in, in various quarters, uh, often to actually justify, uh, to claim that there was no systemic bias. And so there were a number of statistical issues there. So people were analyzing data that was, uh, uh, stop, stop data that was generated by police departments and showing that subsequently in those stops, use of force against black and white civilians was not all that different. The issue is that, just like I was mentioning earlier, that the selection and who, who shows up in those data sets is enormous. And so obviously black civilians are being detained in, in situations where white civilians often would not. And when you actually account for that, the, the disparities in police use of force are, are staggering. And so it was just a, a campaign by more statistically minded individuals uh, at Wharton, uh, Princeton, some of my collaborators uh, at other schools to push back. And, and ultimately that, that was a, a fight that led to a, a number of uh, uh, changes in the way that civil rights analytics is done today and the retraction of some of those uh, really troubling papers. 
Thank you. Thank you all for, for sharing your background research interest. I really want to dive deeper into some of what you've already sort of shared with us. So Hamza, let's go back to you. Uh, in your research on human, human trafficking and also on the spread of COVID-19, you used machine learning to extract critical insights. What drew you to the use of, of machine learning as a methodology and what are some of your most important findings? That's an excellent question. Um, so I guess large data streams like satellite data or deep web data that we're using have recently given us sort of unprecedented visibility into previously opaque problems like human trafficking. Uh, but these data sets are very large, they're highly complex, noisy, high dimensional, uh, making them essentially impossible for humans to go through or comprehend manually. Uh, so in these settings, like machine learning is critical to uncover patterns and extract insights from these data sets. Uh, and the resulting models, when designed appropriately, uh, can get much better performance than traditional handcrafted rules by human experts. Uh, so, for example, using machine learning models on tests performed at the Greek border, we were able to track, you know, infection risk across large populations in different parts of the world better than the traditional epidemiological models. Uh, for human trafficking, my PhD student, Pierre Amchanani, and I used uh, deep learning to process 14 million deep web ads on commercial sex sales websites to identify entities that were deceptively recruiting vulnerable populations for non-sex jobs like modeling or massage, and then selling sex to customers, suggesting a high risk for sex trafficking, that they were being pulled in using deceptive job offers and then actually being uh, used to sell sex. Uh, so this information can provide a powerful complement to traditional leads and qualitative interviews with trafficking victims, which are necessarily much smaller scale. So if you think about your very high quality data you're getting from experts, and then you have kind of this uh, more biased, but much higher volume and representative data that you can collect from uh, machine learning based sources. Uh, and this, uh, Using an active learning approach, we identified over 20 types of deceptive recruiting that our domain expert partners at the Telfinder Alliance weren't previously aware of. So it does provide an important complement, uh, which can inform job search training for vulnerable populations, you know, like maybe don't respond to these kinds of ads. They might be deceptive. You might get trafficked. Uh, we also found a couple surprising insights that while, you know, sex sales are concentrated in large urban cities like New York City or Los Angeles, recruitment vi uh, victims actually tends to occur in smaller, less resource cities. Uh, and this is important because law enforcement and social work efforts are largely focused on large, well-resourced cities because that's where we see sex sales happening more prominently. But reallocating social work resources to these recruitment hotspots that we can find can help prevent victims from being trafficked in the first place or help law enforcement attack these supply chains from kind of both ends, like both the recruitment and the sales ends. Yeah, it's really fascinating, and it just shows how relevant some of the research insights that are coming out of business schools and, and schools like Wharton on the real world and uh, the way in which you're having an impact um, on human lives. Uh, Dean, back to you. In your research on bias and policing, what kind of unconventional data are you looking at and what kinds of tools are you using? Right. To, to, to step back, I think the challenges that, that we face in policing are very similar to some of these other extremely challenging contexts where we don't have the gold standard data, the, the, the fine-grained instrumentation that we really like, that we'd really like to in order, in order to be able to solve these problems uh, efficiently. And so essentially all of the work that we do in, in triangulating and pulling together these unconventional sources is trying to get around that problem in, cl in clever ways. So if you think about uh, discrimination in a police encounter, it's it, it's a question about whether from the moment an officer lays eyes on a civilian, what what chain of events enforcement actions take place that would not otherwise have taken place if that civilian had been white. And, and the problem is that we simply don't have any record of the vast majority of those encounters. If an officer doesn't take that initial step of detaining the civilian, it, it vanishes into the ether as far as data analysts are concerned. And so what we do is we pull in traffic sensors, these magnet, magnetic sensors that are embedded in roadways that can tell us, for example, how many vehicles are passing by overhead and who's speeding, uh, which we can then compare to police records of who's actually stopped. Uh, and of course, that's incomplete information because we don't know the race of the drivers, but every, every drop of data helps. We pull in sources like what Duncan was talking about, uh, mobile location data that tells us who's walking around a neighborhood at a given time and what the composition of that group is, where they're coming from, what their movement patterns are. Uh, we pull in all kinds of additional data sources, uh, in including even using police body cam videos themselves to audit the records uh, 
the officer's narrative of what took place and verify that against a, a more objective video record. And, and because these things, as, as Hamza was saying, because this is high dimensional complex video data, we have to build computer vision, audio analysis tools in order to process that in a way that's feasible given the limited human expert resources that we have. Sounds complex, uh, but definitely worthwhile given the impact that you're having. Uh, Duncan, at the Penn Media Accountability Project, what are you hoping to achieve and what kind of data are you working with? Yeah, so it's a very different context to the one that uh, the ones that Hamza and, <clears throat> and Dean were uh, were talking about. But uh, you know, maybe surprisingly, we, we run into many of the same issues, right? That that uh, you know, if you think about the you know the media ecosystem, uh, you have you know, of course, uh, you know, uh, you know, tens of thousands of web publishers. Uh, you have, uh, you know, hundreds of, uh, of you know, TV uh, channels, cable channels, uh, you know, small local stations, et cetera. Uh, so you have, uh, you know, not to mention radio and other media. So you have an enormous, uh, uh, you know, population of very heterogeneous producers of content, everything from, you know, the New York Times and CNN, you know, down to, you know, some guy sitting in his basement, uh, you know, running a YouTube channel. Um and uh, and so all of these different actors are producing, uh, you know, content that could be, you know, important to, uh, you know, could be relevant to public opinion and the sort of information that people are getting. Um, but they're doing it in very different ways and they're doing it in different kinds of media uh, with social media, uh, web, TV, etc. Uh, and so just trying to capture that holistically uh, is an incredibly uh, difficult undertaking because none of it is is instrumented consistently. None of it is is stored centrally, uh, and so there's huge challenges associated with just gathering data on the production side. Um, and then you have a similar challenge on the consumption side that you have, of course, uh, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of people in this country and you know billions of people around the world who are encountering this information, and they're doing it, uh, you know, by browsing the web, by looking on their mobile devices and tablets. Uh, and, and of course, you know, people still watch a tremendous amount of television uh, and, you know, get a lot of their news that way. Uh, and so these are, again, sort of, you know, all of this information is coming from many different sources uh, through different uh, channels through to people. Uh, and, you know, we have to, again, sort of solve this problem of, 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 of tracking all of that holistically to get a real sense of you know, what is being said and, and, and what is being consumed and how is that translating into, uh, into outcomes like public opinion and understanding and attitudes uh, that, that, that are ultimately what we, what we care about. Uh, so we spend a lot of time uh, working with large data sets and working with uh, external data providers, just like Dean and Hamza, uh, uh, to try to kind of wrap our arms around this very large, very complex, very heterogeneous uh, ecosystem. So I want to stick with you for a minute, Duncan, because I'm wondering, given all of the opinions that exist around the world on media at the moment, are there mm -hmm. patterns within the media or are there social undercurrents that you've been able to shine a light on because of the work that mm -hmm. you're doing that we might not have known otherwise? Yeah. So, you know, some of the work that we've done is, is actually very simple um, conceptually, just very descriptive work about, you know, for example, you know, where do people get their news from? Uh, and, you know, over the last five years, uh, six years, there's been, you know, just tremendous focus on social media that, that, uh, that you, know, you know, tens of thousands of papers have been written about, uh, you know, about misinformation and, and fake news circulating on social media. Uh, and you might think that we're all sort of drowning in this sea of, of online misinformation. If you were if you were paying attention to the research and to the to the media coverage of that research, um, but what we find when we look at the behavioral data, when we actually uh, you know take very large representative samples of uh, of U.S. citizens or U.S. residents, and uh, and and look at what they're what they're how they're spending their time and what they're consuming, uh, we find you know first of all that the vast majority of people consume very little news at all. Um, so, uh, you know, three quarters of the, of the U S population spends, you know, less than one minute per day 
you know, consuming news online, right? So that includes social media and everything else, right? That's online. So, uh, so you know, those of us in the academic world who spend you know half of our time on Twitter are sort of obsessed with the idea that that uh, you know that that everybody is being influenced by what happens on Twitter. But that is not the case for the vast majority of Americans. Where they do get their information from is television, uh, and we find that to the extent that Americans uh, consume news, uh, it is it is it is news that comes on TV by by a factor of five to one uh, across the across the population, uh, and you know that that ratio changes depending on age. So for younger people, uh, it's um, it's more like two to one, and for older people, it's more like eight to one. But across every demographic in the country. Uh, TV dominates online as a source of news. And this is something that, that people find very surprising, particularly people in the research community who have been, who have been essentially ignoring television uh, as a source of misinformation uh, over the last several years and, and focusing very much on social media. So just sort of very simple stuff like that, just going and looking and measuring things in a, in a careful, systematic and holistic way can kind of upend your 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 priors about like what is going on in the world and where we have to look more deeply to see problems. So it clearly fascinating, and I think it is um, surprising to most of our audience the the findings that you had there because to your point, we oftentimes assume that social media is the culprit and we've not paid as much attention to traditional forms of media. Uh, Duncan, one last question for you, and I might also open this up for Hamsa and Dean as well. Very quickly, how do you access all of this data? I mean, each of you use reams and reams of, of data. How do, you, how do you access it? And are there partners that you work with in order mm -hmm. to come to this data? Yeah, so we, we work with uh, with uh, third-party companies. Uh, so uh, Nielsen is an example. Uh, it's a you know huge uh, uh, metrics media metrics firm, uh, and they are known for um, for what they call the upfronts, where uh, every year advertisers and 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 broadcasters get together and decide how much to uh, to pay for TV ads, what the price of TV ads should be. And the data that they rely on is Nielsen is Nielsen data, which is very sort of detailed household level data about you know who is cons who is watching uh, different TV programs and broken down by by demographics so it's extremely valuable data that is is widely used in the in the advertising industry um, but we are we, we're we're very fortunate to get that data from from Nielsen along with their web and mobile uh, panel data uh, which gives us a sort of unprecedented insight into uh, you know sort of uh, uh, you know, overall consumption patterns in a very detailed way, you know, it's sort of literally at the at the individual level, you know, what are the links that people are looking at? What are the URLs that people are looking at online? What are the programs minute by minute that people are watching on television? So very sort of detailed uh, uh, individual level data. Uh, and then on the on the production side, we have, uh, you know, for example, a, a decade's worth of uh, of television data uh, that uh, uh, comes from a, a, another metrics company called TV Eyes. Uh, and they uh, they are in the business of uh, of you know uh, telling their customers you know when their when their brand names are mentioned uh, on TV for example, um, and so they have you know incredibly complete coverage of essentially every TV program broadcast in the country uh, over the last decade, uh, and so uh, we have assembled that uh, data set as well so that we can track in a very systematic way. Uh, you know what different uh, programs and stations and and and, uh, and broadcasters are uh, are talking about and and how they're talking about it, uh, and allow us to make comparisons. You know, say between different cable providers or between cable and, and network news or national and local news, and all these sorts of of comparisons are now are now possible to do at scale. So there's a lot of you know a lot of working with external people and then a lot of a huge amount of work in, in converting that uh, data from its original form into something that we can use as researchers. Thank you. And before I turn to you, Hamsa and Dean, um, I just want to remind the audience that if you are inspired by anything that our guests have mentioned and, and have a question that you want to pose to them for later on in the show, feel free to go ahead and, and submit your questions. Um, Hamsa and Dean, so a similar question for each of you. The data that you use in your research is challenging, obviously, to gather given the sensitivity. Um, of course, with human trafficking, 
it's necessarily covert and police misconduct is a hot button social and political topic. How do you each uncover and collect the data that drives your research programs? And Hamsa, let's start with you. Oh, that's a great question. We uh, partner with nonprofits and law enforcement to obtain our data sets because uh, scraping them ourselves uh, can be illegal, especially with min minors potentially being involved in trafficking. It's it's a, a, a gray area. So we obtained our original deep web data sets scraped from commercial sex websites from the Call Finder Alliance. They were able to do it legally because they were engaging with law enforcement. Uh, we're currently expanding our efforts with uh, new collaborations with the Global Emancipation Network and the Social, uh, the Suffolk County Anti-Trafficking Initiative to access more detailed data. Uh, one thing we really care about is uh, critically getting inputs from a wide variety of stakeholders. So actually going to sex workers and getting their input on what signals risk uh, officers that are conducting things on the ground, uh, social workers, uh, all of which, you know, provides very different inputs that can be used to improve our machine learning models to give us a more holistic perspective that's sort of fair to all stakeholders involved. Thank you. Uh, Dean, what about... What about you? How do you go about gathering this data? And what are some of the key findings uh, that you've had from your from your research? It's so like like Hamza mentioned, it's it's really a it's a matter of partnerships. So it's an extremely broad based effort. Um, it wouldn't be possible without the team at Research at Police Reform and Accountability, which is actually largely funded by Wharton um, in terms of personnel and, and financial resources. So uh, one arm of that strategy is direct outreach to reform-minded police agencies. So we've reached out to hundreds of, of agencies and, and actually a surprising number of police chiefs are interested in taking the next step and in, are interested in rooting out misconduct, interested in rooting out bias uh, if it exists in their department. They, they actually want to know. And so that's a huge resource because it gives us the ability to send in an analyst and directly embed in that organization um, to pull terabytes of, of data back to d get direct access to body cam footage that is otherwise extremely difficult to do. Uh, so that's that's one arm, it's, it's a crucial arm. Uh, the second has been filing just a staggering number of freedom of information requests to, to agencies all around the US. And so that's something that we've done hundreds of and actually secured extremely granular information on, uh, on virtually all of the largest, uh, of the 100 largest PDs in America. Uh, and the final arm, uh, of course, is working directly with the Department of Justice. So having the full weight of the, of the federal government behind you is, uh, is certainly an effective way to get data. Um, uh, discovery is another extremely effective way of getting data in court battles. And so that's uh, that's been essential as well. Uh, I, I think coming out of all of this, m my biggest takeaway is that uh, the policy reforms are so varied. I mean, in, in America, we have 18,000 police agencies that have different uh, have different law enforcement practices, have different data collection practices, have different problems uh, or faced with different uh, challenges and, and police different communities. And so in some places, it really is a matter of a disproportionate number of officers being sent into minority communities so that when somebody jaywalks or or turns without a, without a blinker, uh, there's an officer there to see them. Uh, in other cases, it's, it's a matter of who officers choose to pull over uh, for otherwise similar behavior. Uh, in, in, I've seen cases where officers, it's about where officers, uh, how officers behave after they pull somebody over, where drivers from one community who are going exactly the same speed, uh, you know, virtually identical circumstances are just cited criminally for speeding at significantly higher rates than, than, than white drivers who tend to receive civil citations. And that, that can compound all the way to use of force. And in, in some cases, unfortunately, uh, just a, a a complete lack of accountability in terms of the number of um, uh, allegations of misconduct that actually get investigated uh, and end in in um, and, and in discipline. I would say that's probably the one most common thread that we've seen in all the agencies that we've looked at: the number of civilian allegations of misconduct that end in actual consequential discipline to the officer is well under one percent. Uh, and so I think that's that's probably the the most um, common finding, unfortunately. Well, each of you are dealing with matters that are highly sensitive and, and heavy. They're weighty issues. And I'm wondering how you have the wherewithal to continue doing this work when so much of it can feel um, just heavy and, and maybe depressive at times. How do, you, how do you keep going in this regard? 
Uh, let's maybe Hamsa, let's go to you for this one. <laughs> um, that's a new one. I, I try to keep a portfolio. Um, so I don't spend more than 50% of my time on these projects. And then I kind of work on lighter projects the other 50% of the time. And, you know, doing teaching and other service uh, obligations in the community also makes me feel better. Um, well, you mentioned teaching. I'm curious, do you bring this research into the classroom? And how do you, if so, how do your students react to it? They um, are growingly, I think our generation is more excited about doing social impact work. Um, so there's been a move or a shift uh, from just, uh, I guess Wharton had a lot of finance that was coming out. Uh, so I actually saw when I first started teaching that most people, uh, so I teach optimization and simulation. So a lot of the same techniques that can interface with machine learning models. Uh, and I only started recently, but even since then, I've seen a shift that students are increasingly more and more interested in social impact problems. Uh, I've had several undergrads who've like gone on into doing uh, impact investing and other types of uh, socially impactful careers that have analytics or uh, optimization embedded in it, which is just very heartwarming <laughs> uh, and satisfying to see as, a, as an instructor. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a fun experience. And Dean, let me. I would echo that. You, yeah, with with the policing work. Just on the teaching very, point. Please. Yeah. Go. Uh, well, I think on the on the teaching point, uh, I think there's been a huge appetite from from students uh, to just see the practical impact and the importance of getting the statistics the statistics right. Um, so I, I think the the issues that we pointed out with selection bias and and the fact that is essentially when you take a police data set as given ignoring the, the potential discrimination that, that may have occurred at prior stages and, and who shows up in that data set is essentially what you're guaranteeing is that any estimate you get out of that subsequent analysis is going to understate the true disparity. Because you're not comparing apples to apples, you're not comparing white and black bank robbers, you're comparing white bank robbers to, sure, black bank robbers, but also black people who are stopped for nothing more than jaywalking. And so I think that has um, that's actually very quickly become one of the most common teaching examples for, for selection bias in statistics more generally, uh, which I think is, is, is great. You know, I think anytime we can connect the, the analytics, these, these sort of dry concepts to, to real world implications, I think that's, that's hugely beneficial for teaching. And Duncan, let me go to you. How does your work play itself out in the classroom? Um, you know, I, I teach a course uh, in Wharton um, uh, called Explaining Explanation, uh, and it it um, you know it it it's about the 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 nature of explanation and what are we what are we you know we use this word explanation all the time like we explain things to each other we explain things in the media we explain things in our scientific papers we're all in the business of explaining things. Um, and when we when we use that word, I think you know we assume that we know what it means, and we assume that other people mean the same thing by it uh, as we do. Um, but actually, neither of those assumptions turns out to be true, right? That that explanation means many different things, uh, sometimes logically distinct things, uh, and uh, we get confused about what we're doing when we when we when we explain stuff, even even in science, uh, and and so. Uh, you know, and so that creates, uh, you know, a lot of problems for, uh, for us as a scientific community uh, to be confident when we actually know things, right? Uh, and so, you know, in, in, in psychology, uh, you know, as, as you know, over the last decade or so, there's been a lot of, of, uh, of consternation about the so-called replication crisis. Uh, and many uh, results that um, previously we had thought to be, to be, you know, true have turned out not to be true. Um, and that, uh, you know, has led to sort of much wider um, concerns about, you know, the, the veracity or the credibility of, 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 of social science and, and science more generally. Uh, and, you know, I think that, you know, a lot of it comes down to this question of like what we think we're doing when we explain something and what are the standards of evidence that we, uh, that we uh, bring to bear when we say we know how something works. Um, and uh, and so that you know uh, is a you know tremendously interesting class that they teach, and and it, we am able to sort of bring in lots of examples from uh, the kinds of, of research that um, you know that I'm uh, that I'm doing, uh, you know both uh, you know the research findings themselves, but also you know particularly in the media case, 
uh, you know, there's just so many examples uh, in everyday journalism where, you know, you read some article or you watch some program uh, and, you know, it's, it's, um, it's leading you to believe that something has been explained, right? It's, le- it's telling you, uh, you know, how something works in the world or why something happened. Uh, and, you know, almost always it's wrong. Right. Um, or or as we say, not even wrong. Right. Uh, that it's it's not it's not right. It's not wrong. It's just a story. Uh, and other stories could have been told. Uh, and if those stories had been told, you would have had a very different impression of what was happening in the world. Uh, and I, my my experience of teaching this material has been sort of like, um, you know, lifting the veils on people's eyes where they. They sort of come in thinking, oh, I know how things work. You know, I trust science. I trust the media. I, you know, I believe that we've sort of got a system for discovering knowledge that's reliable. And then sort of week by week over the course of this, <laughs> of this class, everybody sort of gets sort of increasingly more depressed and despondent. Um, and then, you know, towards the end, we try to kind of, you know, bring it back up again and say, look, there are things that we can do. Uh, there are ways to do better. Um, and we need to take it very seriously and we need to be humble about what can be accomplished. But it is possible to, to, to make science better. It is possible to make the media better. It is possible to make society better. And so I sort of always balance this sort of, I, I always sort of live in this, in this tension between feeling sort of frustrated and, and, and disappointed at, at how sort of bad everything is, um, but also endlessly i feel so optimistic i always feel like this is this is a challenge this is something that we can do and this is something that we should do and that's what you know that's what we should be doing as as academics and as researchers is trying to sort of learn what we don't know and then try to fix it thank you for thank all of you for sharing that i have one last question before we move to the audience q a and how are the questions that you're asking about how these social issues are evolving uh, and leveraging your use of data and analytics. What are you thinking about doing next in the context of your your scholarship in this regard? Dean, let's start with you. Well, I think something that came out of our initial research uh, was that there were there were aspects of the process that we would never be able to to shed light on with police administrative records alone, right? relying on on records that that were written down and recorded by officers. And so we tried to push a little bit further. Uh, so we tried to pull in auxiliary data sources to shed light on objective external circumstances. So that what was happening around, what, you know, who was who was there. Uh, you know, the, the example of, of vehicle uh, traffic measurement, but but increasingly it it's became clear that that without actually diving into the encounter, without access to, to the video, uh, that we wouldn't be able, that there would be a limit on, on how much we could explain. Right? The, the, in the back and forth between the civilian and the officer was a huge part of that, uh, was a huge part of the, the story that we were trying to tell. And so that's what motivated this work on, on computer vision, on, on, speech, re- on speech recognition. Uh, essentially, what we're trying to do is segment that encounter into almost like a, a storyboard or um, like a movie script that ex- that explains how how individuals pass back and forth uh, the flow of conversation, what, how a civilian responds to an officer, and how that affects the way that the officer responds to the civilian. To be able to detect actions like when a civilian is approaching or retreating from the officer, uh, to detect actions like when an officer yells halt or or draws a weapon on the civilian, and so uh, it's become clear from from our work that without taking this next step, there's always gonna be that limit on what we're able to say. And so that's what's kicked off what, what I think is gonna be a, a pretty ambitious three to five year project that, that's um, tr- trying to push the, the frontier on, on what we can do with, with uh, first person video. Thank you. Uh, Hamsa, what's next for you? Um, I'm really excited about some work we've been doing on the HALT side uh, with a startup called Macroize on improving uh, essential medicine distribution and health worker staffing in Sierra Leone. Uh, so we're building uh, state-of-the-art demand forecasting models to ensure that you know limited resources of essential medicines or workers are at the right place at the right time. Uh, I think one issue we keep running into in any of these kinds of problems is that data quality is not equitably distributed. So even in Sierra Leone, if you look at poorer areas like Western Sierra Leone, those health facilities have often have more missing or unreliable data than facilities near their relatively richer capital, Freetown. 
Uh, and that means that our predictive models will function better for some subpopulations than others. So if you just directly plug these predictions into traditional optimization models to allocate resources, we're going to make worse decisions for those data poor subpopulations, which is, of course, highly undesirable. Uh, so we're trying to develop uh, multimodal methods that integrate different noisy data views on these health supply chains, like pulling in satellite data or health usage data from other related products to address this uh, data equity challenge. Uh, and I think this sort of feeds into the human AI interface question more broadly. Ultimately, these predictions inform decisions by human stakeholders, so they need to be cognizant of the human workflows and how these decisions actually get operationalized on the ground. Uh, so for instance, we may suggest some sort of resource allocation, and then it turns out it's you know impossible to execute because the road system facilities are down or the requisite drivers didn't show up. Uh, and of course, again, this will introduce more equity challenges because they're, they're, these roads uh, infrastructure issues tend to plague certain subpopulations more than others. So a good model will be sufficiently interpretable so human decision makers can kind of deviate intelligently when new information or constraints come to light. And the machine learning process itself is kind of human in the loop in that it depends on inputs from humans. But of course, we as humans have our own biases and incorrect beliefs, kind of like Dean was talking about, based on our narrow set of experiences. So it's kind of important to build these models based on inputs from diverse stakeholders and populations, which introduces, I think, some interesting technical challenges. So I actually, Duncan, I know I haven't come to you on this response, but I want to pick up on something that Hamza said, because a question has come in from the audience that highlights your last point, Hamza, and that is how do you address the bias which might be present in the data itself? And to what degree have you had to accept that the data sources may be flawed? And how do you deal with that once you do? So Hamza, let's start with you and then anyone else who can pick up on that. Yeah, that is absolutely a big concern that we have. So uh, there are some statistical things that you can do with the data um, to try to correct for bias. But uh, like Dean was saying, there's only so far you can go with imperfect data. There's only so much of a view you can bring in. Uh, so that's when we really try to bring in other types of data. So for example, let's say that we're worried that um, for various like children's or infant medicine or medicines for pregnant women, uh, we don't have accurate uh, data from you know the Western province provinces in Sierra Leone, but we do near the capital, then we might think about bringing in, you know, satellite data, uh, census data, and other kinds of data sources to infer how many new births are in those regions, like what is the right kind of amount of uh, medicine we should be sending to that location, and then trying to correct for the biases that we see in the missing data. Uh, same thing with like the human trafficking work, like uh, law enforcement has a very uh, specific kind of view into these problems. If you talk to sex workers, their perspective is totally different. Uh, so I don't think there is any kind of perfect data set in these settings. So the bias is always gonna be there, but if we can try to bring in uh, data sets from diverse perspectives, from diverse stakeholders, then we can kind of try to build a more holistic representative view that hopefully will be more fair and equitable to everyone. Duncan, uh, same question for you. How do you address the bias in your data sets? And then Dean, I want to move to you on this question. Um, so, you know, great, great question. Um, you know, every everything, uh, uh, you know, every 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 type of data has has biases. So, you know, one one of the the points that we've been trying to make in our research is that you know a lot of uh, a lot of existing data about media consumption comes from surveys. That if you that you know. Uh, you go out and you conduct a survey and you ask people, you know, where do you get your news from? Uh, and what we've been able to show is that, uh, is that those surveys have you know, very large biases in them because people over-report how much news they consume uh, and, they, and they dramatically over-report, uh, you know, how much uh, time, how much news they get from, from social media. Uh, and so we can get very misleading um, uh, uh, just sort of ideas about the world by focusing on what people uh, say they're doing. Um, but of course, if you track behavioral data, that's also got problems, right? That, uh, that you know, if you if you look at, uh, you know, uh, web data, some you might say, well, what about mobile uh, traffic? That's important. And then, you know, you get mobile panel and that's uh, recorded in a somewhat different way. And so that has problems. And uh, And even with television, which I think is probably the, uh, the, the, the best instrumented uh, panel that we have, you know, you have all kinds of questions about, well, who joins the panel and are they representative of, of the general population? And, 
you know, what if they, you know, what if they don't turn their meter on? And what if they, you know, two people are watching television at the same time? Uh, you know, so there's all kinds of problems that you that you come up with. And so the way we try to deal with it is really uh, to to be open about uh, the potential for bias and to, you know, rather than uh, uh, making, you know, point estimates uh, of, uh, of, you know, uh, outcomes of interest, we, we, we try to specify ranges, right? So, uh, you know, for one specific example, you know, we, we have a paper about echo chambers. So this, this is, you know, a, a, a phenomenon in which, you know, people uh, get, uh, you know, a large portion of their news uh, from ideologically homogeneous sources, right? And so the, uh, the the concern is that if you're doing that, then you're not getting a diversity of, 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 of perspectives. And so you might have a skewed biased view of reality. Um, but the problem is when you say something like a large portion of content from ideologically homogeneous sources, what do you mean by a large portion, right? Is that 50%? Is that 75%? Is it 99%? Like all of these different thresholds will give you very different numbers about, you know, uh, about how many people are in echo chambers. And the same thing is true for ideologically homogeneous. How do you measure that? And so every, everything that you do, every statement that you make, you know, embeds certain kinds of assumptions that you have to, uh, that you have to uh, articulate in your methods. And so rather than just picking one value and saying, here's what we found, we say, well, you know, we'll, we'll kind of leave it to you, the reader, to decide whether you think this is the right number. So here's what it looks like if you pick 50%. Here's what it looks like if you pick 75%. Some things change, some things stay the same. So you can actually figure it out yourself. Uh, and then, you know, going along with that, uh, you know, a major, you asked earlier, what's the sort of what's coming up next? Uh, you know, a major effort um, in, uh, in, in the PenMap project is to, to sort of move from, you know, publishing our results in scientific journals, which of course we'll continue to do, to making it available online in the form of interactive dashboards so that, you know, people, journalists, activists, um, uh, you know, interested, uh, you know, interested consumers can come and play around with the data themselves, and they can and they can uh, gain insights uh, uh, that uh, allow them to to sort of fiddle with some of these assumptions to to understand better, uh, you know, what's going on. Uh, and those dashboards are, are sort of going to be living artifacts that will uh, continue to evolve over time. So rather than doing some analysis and publishing a, a, a figure in a paper that then remains you know, frozen in time forevermore, uh, you know, every month or, or however frequently we get new data, we'll be able to update these dashboards so you can see these trends evolving over time. So this uh, you know, interactivity and, and, and dynamism, I think are, are, are sort of two features that we, that we hope will, will make the data more, um, uh, um, more um, accessible to a broader population. Thank you. Dean, uh, quickly, last, same question to you on uh, data by bi the biases that exist in the data themselves. This is such a fun, this is such a fundamental question in the study of policing that, that we've started to build more general tools because the kinds of biases that you encounter in different circumstances are always going to be different. Doug talked about uh, you've got some panel of people that you can measure behavior on, but who chooses to be in that panel? And Hamza talked about you have instrumentation, you can measure inventory, but then due to due to some power outage issues, due to other issues, the, the, the measurement error is just much wider in certain communities than others. And so what we've started to develop is tools for formalizing, right? Here's the true process that I'm trying to study. Here's the indirect, here's the proxies or the imperfect measures of, of those concepts or the or this limited slice of the data that I'm actually able to see. Uh, to go from that to being able to automatically push these these chained inferences about, all right, given what I know and acknowledging what I don't know, what are the best and worst case scenarios, depending on what you believe about various unobserved components of the process? And that, that can be quite tricky for a human to do uh, at scale. I mean, in, in, some sets, in some circumstances, we can do it, but because of the way those unseen parts can interact, uh, having a computer to, uh, to help automate and reason about those possibilities is quite helpful. And so that's, that's what we started to develop, these, these automated tools for, for reasoning about the world from this bias, from this incomplete information. Okay. So, Dean, while I have you, there's another question that came in that asks, what challenges do you face in data fusion? 
Yeah. So data fusion, for those who aren't familiar, is is this this task of pulling in data from, say, a police department and then fusing that with information from a mobile location provider. Um, there, there, the problem is really ensuring that when you when you merge those data sets, there, you can really think about them as two different views, two different directions onto the same phenomenon, each of which gives you partial information about what you're trying to do. So alignment there is extremely important. So making sure that that those things are really speaking about uh, that they're measuring concepts in the same way that 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 the units, the geographic units, for example, that we're referring to, uh, are are comparable. Because uh, without that, you can get into scenarios where um, data that looks like it should be it should be fusible will actually generate these impossible circumstances. Like uh, if you if you don't account for that misalignment, it can it can appear that. Uh, there's no possible truth that could have generated both of those views, right? And so what you have to account for is that you have the true process and then you have this like misalignment of the units uh, that are being measured, whether it's geography or the way that like a visit to a store or um, like mobility is defined differently in, in Department of Transportation statistics as opposed to these mobile location data statistics. And you have to account for that additional step of mismeasure mismeasurement before you're able to, to do that complete fusion step. So this is an active area of research in statistics. Uh, it's an extremely difficult problem. Uh, Hamsa, I noticed you smiled when I asked that question. Is there anything you'd like to add to the question on data fusion? Uh, I think deep sensor was excellent. Uh, I think one issue that we also run into uh, when we're scraping you know, natural language data or uh, probably like the body cam data, Sure. Um, is being able to access uh, structured information, put it into structured databases so you can actually do the merge. Uh, so if you're looking at, say, uh, commercial sex ads on the internet, uh, you want to be able to pull out info important metadata like uh, phone numbers or email addresses or websites that you can actually use to merge with other data sources. And then once you get that business information, you can uh, you can merge it with, you know, uh, online customer reviews or sex worker feedback on that business. Uh, and so that's actually a pretty uh, interesting, exciting problem in natural language processing and in databases about being able to pull out that information in an automatic, structured way because you can't do it manually for you know 14 million ads or whatever scale we're looking at. Um, and then once you do that, um, you know there's like fuzzy matching issues; they'll never match exactly. And so you know there's some um, exciting work there. Great. So I think we're down to the last question. We've let me let's see. We've talked a lot about inputs and methods. Let's also talk about the dissemination of results. So what works in helping the public leaders and policymakers understand the conclusions of your work and actually getting them to take action on it? Uh, Duncan, let's start with you. Well, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great question and, a, and an ongoing challenge for, you know, for many people in, in academia is that we're, you know, we are sort of highly incentivized to, uh, you know, publish papers in journals. That's how we are, you know, that's how we get jobs. That's how we get promoted. Um, that's how we get recognized by our peers. Um, but of course, you know, the rest of the world doesn't tend to read, uh, you know, papers in, in academic journals. And so we have to look for other ways to uh, to have to, to speak to them and to be understood. Uh, and so, you know, one way that we do that is by writing, uh, you know, uh, accessible uh, general, um, you know, lay versions of, of the papers that we write and we publish them on our website and we do our best to, to try to, uh, to circulate, uh, you know, those essays. Um, but also, as I mentioned earlier, I think you know one big bet that we're making is to try to to build these uh, to build these uh, interactive data visualizations or dashboards uh, that will you know hopefully allow um, uh, the the people to uh, to you know uh, access the data more or less directly uh, and to have a um, you know to sort of build their own understanding of of, of what's going on uh, in in the media landscape. Um, and just sort of one example of that um, that, that we're, we're really excited about is, you know, we talk a lot about truth and facts uh, in the media. And we, again, we sort of use these words as if, uh, as if you know, they're sort of, you know, we know what they mean uh, and we mean the same thing that other people do. Um, but it, it turns out that, you know, truth is, is an extremely elusive concept. Like once you start sort of, you know, reading, uh, you know, text and saying, okay, what are all the facts in this text and can I classify them as true or false? Uh, it immediately becomes clear that that is uh, almost always difficult to do. Um, 
And so instead, uh, we, we're trying to sort of shift away from, you know, is something true or false to, um, you know, how, how, how is information biased? Right? So whenever uh, you read a media article, you should always wonder, you know, why, why did they write about this topic and not some other topic? You know, why do we, you know, read thousands of articles about inflation um, and very few articles about uh, employment? Right. I know in both cases, uh, we you know in, in the last year or so, we've seen record high inflation and also record low unemployment. Um, but we've seen far more coverage of the first issue than of the second issue. And so that tells a story about the state of the economy that's largely negative. But you could easily imagine a different story being told uh, just by changing the emphasis of what's being talked about. And then similarly, once you start talking about something, the way you talk about it uh, is essentially up to you, right? So this is what we call framing bias, that you can you pick, you know, given that you're talking about a topic, you can spin it in a positive way, you can spin it in a negative way, and it's almost always possible to do this. And journalists and politicians have tremendous discretion over how they spin things. Uh, and so what we would like to be able to do is make that more visible, right? Because typically what happens when you, when you consume media all of this is is invisible to you. It's presented as if it's objective. It's presented as if it's inevitable. Uh, this had to be talked about and had to be talked about in this way. Um, and so, by I, by kind of exposing the you know the way the sausage is made and showing uh, people you know the the presence of selection and framing bias, I think we can we can do a lot to to um, uh, to just sort of help educate people about what's going on. And and so. Rather than asking if this is true or false, they can ask, how is this biased? And how, why am I thinking about this and not some other thing? And why is this story being told and not some other story? And how would my impression have changed if, if, I, had, if I had seen it uh, presented in a different way? So that's, I think, you know, a, big, a big bet for us to try to, 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 to make that uh, available to the public. So, Dean, I'll give you the last word on this topic. Um, how do how do you hope, or how have you seen uh, your results have impact with the uh, policymakers and other influencers? I, I think, in some ways, the the task that my team has is is much easier uh, because we don't have to grapple with the national discourse. So we we work directly with with the policymakers, with, with the decision makers, with concerned police agencies, with civil rights organizations. And so it, in a sense, it's, it's, uh, it's a much easier problem. And, and I think the way that we, that we tackle it starts with listening very carefully to the needs of the stakeholders. Uh, I think so many, so many partners are, are, are leery of academics coming in, taking their data, making a lot of work, and then writing a paper and, and, and never, you know, never being heard from again. And I, I think Part of what's so great about being at Wharton is that that's just not how it works here. We, we stick around, we we implement things, uh, we, we stay uh, in the organization. And so it, that's been, and I think those continued relationships give us continued access to data, like give us the trust um, that allows us to propose larger and larger reforms. And, and so uh, just speaking for myself, you know, we've seen changes in the way that the entire Department of Justice conducts pattern and practice investigations of police departments. So we're currently implementing those revised methods, uh, a lot of the methods that we talked about today in the ongoing investigations of Louisville Metro PD in Minneapolis and Phoenix uh, and, and beyond. And, and so that's been really uh, heartening to see. And so, but again, I think it starts from trying to really understanding what is it that the stakeholders are trying to accomplish, giving them the tools, but then showing them that we can actually go a step beyond that. So this has been a very inspiring hour for me, uh, listening to you, understanding the impact of the work that you're having and the way that it's really transforming uh, societal issues and challenges in extremely positive ways. So thank you for your spending time with us today on Beyond Business, but also more importantly, thank you for the contributions that you're making to the world and helping utilize business for good. And thank you to our audience for participating in today's Beyond Business conversation. We hope to see you at our next event in January when we look at the role analytics plays both on and off the field in professional sports. Until then, have a great end of the year, everyone.